I'm Mick Fanning. As a professional surfer, I meet champions from many sports, but there's one who stands out, Wallaby star David Pocock. At 27, Dave is now one of the best rugby union players in the world, but it's what he does off the field that makes him a real hero to me. He stands up for what he believes in, and I think that's pretty gutsy. Tonight we travel with Dave back to Zimbabwe, the only home he knew until his family fled to Australia when he was 14. Dave is totally an Australian, but he says Africa is part of his life, not just somewhere he visits. Let's carry on slowly. He connects back to the people he knows, the African people. He connects back to the nature he's so passionate about, the birds and the wildlife. I have lots of fond memories for me as a kid growing up in Zimbabwe. It's one of those things where you grow up in a place, um, you always have that connection to it. These are tense and dangerous times in Zimbabwe's rural hinterland. The campaign of intimidation on the farm shows little sign of easing. Leaving Zimbabwe and, and coming to Australia, pretty much everything about our lives changed. The kids saw too much. It affected them greatly. I think my coping mechanism was sport. That's what I, I threw myself into, I became obsessed about. Pocock is arguably the best in the world. Rugby isn't defining for Dave, it's, it's not what defines him as a person. What I've seen in his life so far is a desire for social justice. The African story, the Australian migrant, now the wallaby. His story has shaped the man, and I don't think you can understand him without knowing his story. <laughs> what are you selling? I'm selling this stuff here. Okay. So he's gonna go get a reckon. It's like a slingshot. It's a good one. Three dollars. Apparently, these are the best reckons in Zimbabwe. Yeah, okay, this one. We're heading from Bulawayo down towards Bight Bridge. My grandfather and uncle are still trying to run a, a citrus farm and a, a game farm, a wildlife conservancy. By the end of the World Cup, I was certainly looking forward to a break. I, I try and get to Zimbabwe once a year. I've still got some family here. We've definitely talked about living in Zimbabwe for a time. Dave just has such a deep sense of responsibility to make a positive contribution there. On both my mum and dad's side, uh, they've been in Southern Africa for at least five generations. It's still a very special place to me. Could be egrets. David has come back every year. First, he's been able to afford to do it since he became a rugby player, and he just loves the country. He's got a tremendous passion for the wildlife farm. Now you know what that bird is. Calling David. You'll always find a bird book under his arm or, or something like that. He he just loves it out here, and you know he was brought up here, and he just loves it. They call lapwings now. Oh no, come off it now. <laughs> oh no man, you've got to learn it all over again. I've always been teasing my family for my love of birds. When I was a kid I'd have like a my bird book and like a list of birds in the area and try and tick them all off when we went wherever we went. Now that's uh, Natal Franklin calling. I'd say Dave always had a special relationship with my dad. When Dave was born, Andy and I had been married for just over two years and um, Andy was managing on my dad's citrus estate. Jane's dad was an agricultural officer back in the 1960s and late 60s he bought the citrus farm, which was just derelict bush, there was nothing there. And by the time I joined him, we had 100,000 citrus trees on the farm, so he, he grew this thing from 
virtually nothing to an incredible enterprise. While we were running the citrus farm, early 80s, he bought the game farm. We used to employ up to 300 people. We led the way in the whole district at the time. Well, that's all gone now. Zimbabwe is very, very different now to when David was a boy. The first year of Dave's life, when we look back on it, it was just idyllic. When Dave was about a year old, and he wanted to go up and join his dad and his brother on a joint farming venture. We moved about 500 k's north to Gweru, which is right in the middle of Zimbabwe. David, who's your brother? Yeah. What's his name? Coco. What's your name? Coco. David Pocock. David Coco. So Dave's one of three brothers. He's the eldest of three. Maybe a male. Growing up on the farm was it was a great childhood. Just being able to do whatever you want. You've got so much space just to go for a ride on your motorbike. You want them in the right or the left year? Right School here. holidays. We wouldn't leave the farm for what, four or five weeks sometimes. We'd just be out there and we'd wake up and go on our own, our own adventures every day. There were a lot of staff working on the farm and they were a huge part of our lives. Shame, David. David was often just doing something that little bit differently. As a 10-year-old in the school holidays, he was setting himself a project to research birds and would write up this whole folder. He's always kind of walked to his own beat in a lot of ways. Hasn't really ever followed the crowd as, as such. Two hands with the ball, what are you doing with one hand? Two hands, go, 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 go. I don't really remember developing an interest in rugby. I, I don't know, it always just seemed like a given. Nice boys. We were always you go, you go. passing with dad or kicking to dad or watching rugby on TV. You two gonna clean? You scrum off, fly half, centre, wing. I guess it's a very white Southern African thing. You you play rugby at school. We've opened up a little a little rugby academy to try and develop the skill level at, at, at junior level because you know I feel that in Zimbabwe our, our skills levels is really deteriorated. Nice, Puyo. Go again, Puyo. Dave started playing rugby when he was five. Every evening we would kick a rugby ball on the lawn, and then it would be getting dark. And I said, guys, I need to go. I'm tired. You know, I need to go inside. And they said, no, just, just some more. Last one, David. And eventually we had this rule, a hundred more. And they would be satisfied if I just kicked a hundred more. And I would count, you know, 99, a hundred. And then on a hundred, I would just walk off. Otherwise, we just would never get out of the garden. Michael. Sibling rivalry was quite strong with the boys because they're all quite strong. So they'd be fighting for supremacy for a lot of the time. <laughs> Dave was always a freak child. At, <laughs> he never used to be able to play with his age group because he used to hurt all the kids, so he always used to play up age group or two, or else all the mums would complain. Go forward, David! That's it, David! I think since probably like seven or eight, I knew that's what I wanted to do after school was play rugby professionally and one day play for the Springboks. I don't know, it was something that I really enjoyed and I wanted to be the best at it. David's working hard, Jay. Oh, shame. Dad always used to say to us as kids that you reap what you sow and all the hard work you put in, you, you will see, see the results of it. Never told David to do his homework, ever. Um, never told him he needs to practice. Um, it, it's, it's just in him. I mean, even if he lost at a game of cards, he'd start crying. So that was an indicator that he was going to achieve something. And uh, it's very rarely you get a man who gets so dedicated from a very, very young age. We didn't really know what was going on, you know, but it, um, he had it in his mind. He, he wanted to get right to the top. What happens if you pull these? Zimbabwe, when the boys were growing up, was just really amazing. We felt relatively safe. There were no restrictions. David, hold on, Daddy's waist. 
But things changed and things happened politically that, that have changed all of that. Martin Olds died in a hail of bullets, trying to fight off a group of armed independence war veterans. Back in about 2000, President Mugabe decided that the land should go back to the people who had fought for the liberation of Zimbabwe. They were called war veterans. And at his party's recent campaign launch, Mr Mugabe insisted half Zimbabwe's white-owned land will be seized for black resettlement. It wasn't a total, total white against black. It was very much a politically driven thing from Mugabe. Down with British imperialism and neo-colonial. A lot of farm workers got beaten up. They set the houses on fire, destroying everything the owners couldn't save. I guess it, it showed that it really it wasn't about land redistribution. It was about votes and it was about a number of other things. Um, and I guess land was just a, a political football for politicians to, to use. Conflict has already spilled onto the streets of Harare as an opposition march turned violent. Black and white were clubbed, kicked and beaten. We are really disappointed. This country belongs to 12 million people, not 50,000 war veterans. People used to get to school and their back windows were smashed in because there were riots in town and, and that was kind of normal. It was really scary, I think, being, being young and not being aware of the entire situation and not being able to know when you're safe and when you're, and when you're not safe. Given what was happening in other areas of the country, Dad had installed like a big security door in the sort of sleeping area of the house where the rooms were that we'd lock each night. I remember being pretty scared, mostly just at night. As a kid, all the different scenarios are, are going through your mind. I remember one time there was a mob of people that we could hear in the area sort of coming along one of the farm roads from a neighbour's farm. And we could hear them chanting, we could hear them shouting. So I just started sh screaming to the boys, grab, grab what you want to take, get in the car, we're going. Dad actually stayed out on the farm at, the, at that moment. It was terrifying, so the fact that we were leaving our farm, but then the fact that we were leaving Dad behind on the farm, not knowing what he was going to encounter. It was very traumatic for the boys, because we couldn't... We ended up having to stay the night in town, and we couldn't contact Andy. We didn't know if he'd been killed. The next day, the farm was peaceful, and it was quiet, and there was no one around other than the workers, and it was life as normal. and. You know, I can just remember thinking, did that really happen? I think the final straw for us was when neighbours of ours who Andy had grown up with um, were ambushed at their gate. They lived about 20 kilometres away and he was, he was shot and killed. And his son, Ian Ellsworth, actually coached him rugby. He's a wonderful young man. And they shot him nine times. We were there in the hospital every day with Ian and, and it, it, that was just so close, they were so in our face and for us after that there was no turning back, we just couldn't bear the thought that that could have been one of our boys. I think when it really sort of sunk in was going to the house a few months later and seeing the, the ute with all the bullet holes sort of sprayed along the one side of the car, um, me and my brothers kind of looking at it and sort of putting our fingers in the holes going, this is pretty... It's like something out of a movie. I was paralysed by fear because I thought if this can happen to a farmer 30 kilometres away, it can just as well happen to both of my parents and then what ends up being of us boys. When will we start picking this, Andy? I think leaving the farm for the final time, I guess the feeling is it's, it's like a death. It was like leaving family, I guess. I mean, that was a farm that Dad bought with his brother and dad. His dad's buried on that farm, so if it was hard for me and my brothers, I can't imagine how hard it was for him. Our closest labour came out, we said our goodbyes, we exchanged some gifts. And one of the hardest things was actually leaving farm workers and people that I'd known my whole life. The only thing I remember was saying goodbye to my nanny, so she kind of was always there 
grew up with her. She always looked after us and came on holiday with us. That was probably the hardest goodbye. It was no longer home and it wasn't really somewhere that we, yeah, wanted to be or felt safe. I think we were very much ready to move on and leave Zimbabwe by that point. Farm workers are continuing to abandon their homes, fearing attacks by independence war veterans. I think as a kid I was fairly oblivious to, I guess, a lot of the history in Zimbabwe. And I guess looking back on it now, as a, you know, a privileged white kid. I think guilt's probably inappropriate. I don't know, feeling when you grow up in a privileged position just because you've been born to certain parents. Though I think just being guilty about it does nothing. Like, I think the, the guilt was definitely there, but I was keen to... I don't ask the question why and how have we allowed our world to get to this? I mean, the almost a million farm workers and you know, I don't know how many were beaten and, and killed as well. That's, that's not the story that, that people hear about. Land was acquired through colonial settler robbery, but we are now the conquerors of those who conquered us yesterday. And I'm very aware that sort of a century before Whites dispossessed the blacks of some of their farm, farming areas, so they, there was an axe to grind. Did land redistribution need to happen? Yes, it did. Just the way it was done was really unjust, and and um, and the violence wasn't necessary. If you talk to the younger generation of Zimbabweans here in Zimbabwe and overseas, and they know that the old way um, was never going to work, and it isn't going to work, there has to be some sort of some sort of healing and reconciliation. I think land will be a huge part of that um, because there really is so much potential. The land distribution system is still going on in Zimbabwe and it's, it's still affecting Pop's game farm and the citrus farm. Is this where the giraffe drink from the top? Yeah, just a drink from the top. <laughs> <laughs> in some ways it's quite hard going back every year and seeing all the challenges and the pressure that places on the Game Scouts, their families, uh, my grandfather and my uncle. My dad and my brother still find themselves in a situation where their land has been um, acquired but yet not properly taken away. For the 13 years that we've been away from Zimbabwe, it's just been this long, involved struggle to try and keep his land. On the wildlife farm, we basically surrounded with uh, farms that the farmers just packed up and left. And uh, that's what they were hoping that we would do, but we haven't. From year 2000, we started to be evicted by these warfights on the property. Then after uh, we've been evicted, they start to take almost everything that was on the property. They used to come down here at our camps and beat us, and the police were doing nothing. People have moved on and started building cattle crawls, yeah. dropping boreholes, getting electricity supplies. So on the left and right from here for the next sort of K. They've brought all their keku, everything. On the property, they seem to be building some other structures on the property, yeah, which is illegally. So this is the guy who's sunk the boreholes? Yeah. The water tanks. I know that Pop doesn't even go back to his citrus farm anymore because it just upsets him. Times are obviously pretty tough. They've had to let most of the citrus trees die just because they couldn't afford to keep watering them with all the uncertainty. And I went up to my house once and up to the office block. And I just looked around it and I, I just couldn't handle it. It provided a wonderful life for us. We worked incredibly hard. I try not to think about it. This is where my folks, it was the manager's house, I think. My folks lived here. Um, so I would have lived here for the first couple of years of my life. Going back there, it's such a mix of emotions. I wouldn't say it's anger, I think it's more disappointment and, and just sadness really, seeing the decline. 
you know, the real victims now left in Zimbabwe are the people because there's extreme poverty, low life expectancy. The situation has stabilised from a lot of the violence and the crime going on. Like, it still is happening to a degree, um, but it's just living in a time now where yeah, anything still can happen in Zimbabwe and that must be quite tough. I'm no worse off than 90% of the other commercial farmers in Zimbabwe. Some of them lost their lives and some of them have lost everything and some of them are destitute. Some of them that were young enough went to Australia and done really well. Leaving Africa was traumatic. It was terrible. You felt like you were letting the other people staying behind down. I had some other farmers telling me I was running away. Uh, I had one farmer's wife telling me I had a, a yellow line, a yellow stripe painted down my back and I was a coward. Moving to Australia, you were just looking for the easy way out or, you know, you should, you should stay if you really love Zimbabwe. My dad told me that we were breaking up the family and we were destroying, but, and we just said, well, we're sorry, but that's what we feel we have to do. Sad. Yes, it still brings a big lump to my throat. We've always really tried not to hold any bitterness or, and, and really practice gratitude. But a lot, of, a lot of grief, a lot of loss. Of course, I'm too old to move anywhere. But in retrospect, it's the finest thing that ever happened for those boys. We arrived in Australia and it was just the five of us. And we had, remember at the airport, we picked up 11 suitcases and that was us. The city centre of Brisbane. Is the Brisbane River, David? Yeah. The really, really tough thing was we had nothing to go back to. We knew that we were here and there was no plan B. This had to work. The shops, you've just been doing homework, as you can see, with no desk. So it's quite tough. The day before the boys needed to start school, we moved into this house and I think we'd bought a fridge and a kettle and yeah that was that was a bit of a shock suddenly thinking okay this is really for real now <laughs> and when we got to australia we d didn't really have the finances for school fees and pop helped out and paid the first year school fees for us good morning australia we have some very very smart future churchy boys going to school it's david in all his glory david, david go back a bit you're too big i can't get you all in at one time as a 14-year-old, rocking up with a different accent and um, a different background, you, d you didn't really fit in. So I think part of it was lost the accent pretty quickly. I was sick of people asking me to say things. OK, so the big day has arrived. We've got beds. Yeah, yeah. it's just the point. The first five years, all of us faced our demons and had to re-establish our identities ourselves. Uh, had to find our feet, had to recover financially or, or at least learn how to survive financially. We were all dealing with stuff when we arrived in Australia, we were all just doing it in very different ways. Steve yeah, probably took it the hardest. I suffered from a lot of anxiety. I um, found it really hard to go to school, to adjust. And actually came to a, quite a big head about three years after being in Australia. Um, where I just completely broke down, was in hospital as an outpatient for about six months with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and it, yeah, took a huge amount of work to to get through that and just to start being a normal, a normal person again. But at the same time, it's something that I'm incredibly get, glad I've gone through and dealt with. I think Dave just threw himself into sport. He's always busy doing some sort of sport, so that's how he dealt with it. I knew I had some trauma stuff in there or some experiences that I needed to actually tell people about and talk through. But in my mind, it was, pff, there's people way worse off. I've got this, this opportunity, I've got the sport. Um, and there's other things that I can control. Dave had always been very focused, but definitely after we came to Australia, um, probably it became a lot more obsessive, a lot more extreme. That first summer holiday would go down to the library and just hire out books and do training sessions from them. And I had this weird thing that in my head I had to do 450 crunches a night or else I was gonna get fat. 
or like if I didn't do it, I was mentally weak. You get, you reap what you sow and you get extreme. So when you go into a boy's room at 11.30 at night and he's doing sit-ups and push-ups, then you know, okay, this is, this is extreme now. His training took first seat to everything else. If it wasn't about his training, get out of the way, because <laughs> he was just a bit obsessed at the time. David's feeding the pigeon. We couldn't go for a family meal because we couldn't find low enough fat food. So it, it wasn't, maybe this is a problem. We knew it was a problem. Dave, when I first met him, was very mature for his age and a, a deep thinker. We decided that we did want to try and do something to, as, as Gandhi put it, to be the change you want to see in the world. I had said to him, oh, Dave, so what do you do? And he said, oh, I play a bit of rugby. And I was like, oh, great. And what do you do for work? There's the steal from Pocock. How good is he? How good is David Pocock? The former Wallabies captain, David Pocock, has been arrested. And we realised that could potentially really blow up in his face with his rugby career. If that was going to jeopardise playing for the Wallabies, then that's how it was going to be. Uh, so we uh, came through the gate two and have been driving a bit. We saw some zebra, we saw some wildebeest, we saw a black-backed jackal, and then we got a flat tyre. <laughs> What's the road trip without a flat tyre? We borrowed this car from some people in South Africa and they um, have been very kind, but we've been so busy trying not to scratch it and now we've stuffed one of the tyres, so we're going to have to replace that. Um, and in the meantime, we've got this half tyre. I've never used one of these before. Which is going to make life interesting. Yeah, we just had a flat tyre, but we're about half an hour away. <laughs> 